My first friend in college, I had kind of identified him a little bit creepily on Facebook. Facebook was new. Just before college started, I identified him on Facebook. I was like, this guy's going to live right next to me. And he seems so cool. We've got a lot in common. We're both film majors. We're going to be best friends. And maybe a little bit by force of will, but also he, he would joke that I, I left my door cracked and I would just like, wave every time he went by, which I don't think is true. It might be a little bit true. But anyway, by force of will, or maybe just the magic of what actually ended up happening, he did become a very dear friend of mine. We traipsed across campus together to go to film school. We worked, worked on each other's little student film sets. We were very dear friends. We shared a lot of things. And even sophomore year, when we weren't living in the same place on campus, we still remained super close. But sophomore year, our second year of college, something started happening. He started to not be able to eat, um, not be able to hold down food, wasn't making it to class, wasn't sleeping. And we were all really worried because we didn't know what was going on with him. And then one night, it was like 11.45 PM, he gave me a call and asked if he could come by to talk. And I was worried that something had gone wrong in a doctor's appointment. He got there slightly after midnight and we sat down outside the dorms and he said, well, you know, international coming out day didn't make this any easier. And he told me that he was gay. And that was why he'd been so sick. This huge piece of him just being tamped down, pressed away, and it was just like fighting to get out. And so he started telling all the people in his life who he loved and who loved him. And it was this beautiful thing because suddenly he could eat again. And suddenly I watched as my friends started coming back to life in so many ways. And he told his parents too. And Holly mentioned Glennon Doyle in her sermon last week and, and when Glennon came out to her parents and how you know open and progressive they were. And it's kind of same deal with what my friend, his parents were very open-minded, progressive folks and, and supportive, but especially his mom was just so afraid. I mean, her whole image of what her son's life was going to be, of what she expected it to be was just shattered. And she was scared for him for what this would mean, for what other people would think of him, how they would see him, how his life would turn out. Fear is a powerful thing. And fear is very, very present in this Easter story. I mean, we have the benefit of 2000 years of removal from it. And most of us, if you grew up around Christianity or in Christianity, we've grown up with the idea of a risen Jesus. That is the part of the, that is a part of the narrative. That is a strong part of the narrative. They tell us that story early and it kind of sticks like it's a little bit key central to this whole story. So we've seen it. We've heard it. We know what's coming. We've got all of that together. But if we can take a step back and look at what these women were experiencing on this day, if you live long enough, you get to a point where you lose somebody that you love with your whole heart. It's just part of being a human. And we know that feeling that in those days, right after the loss and the death, the incredible heaviness of it, just how like the grief hurts so much that it has a taste and it, it hurts so much that you can't move. It's like an elephant sitting on your chest and everything's supposed to stop and yet the world keeps spinning around you. And I imagine that's what those women were feeling. And they wanna do the ritual of grieving and loving, which is going to the tomb and anointing their loved one. And just like we would, we would do the rituals of grieving. And to show up in that ritual at the burial site of a loved one, and for someone to say, you're not here. Don't worry, a stranger, a stranger. In the early hours of the morning, you're vulnerable people in a graveyard by yourself. And for a stranger to say, he's not here, he's risen. He's gone on ahead, don't worry about it, don't be afraid. I would be afraid and I wouldn't believe it. No wonder that's where those women stood. And it's also interesting to note about the gospels that actually all four of them, and I heard this, I mean, I've heard these stories so many times, but I hadn't noticed it until I was listening to Matt Meyer Bolton's podcast about Easter. He's from the Salt Project and is a really brilliant preacher and theologian. And he pointed out that in every single one of the gospel accounts of the resurrection, that Jesus only shows up to his friends. 
He only shows up to the people who know him and love him the most. And even if they were to go run out and tell everybody, who's going to believe them? Who, they're going to be like, okay, yeah, sure, your guy resurrected. Got it. I mean, who's going to believe them? Why didn't Jesus show up in the temple? Why didn't he show up in front of all of the crowds? Why didn't he show up where it made sense? What does the resurrection even matter? This guy, he shows up only to his friends, and then after a little while, he goes away again. And what does it achieve? What does it accomplish? What does it matter? What does it change? Because I look around this world some 2,000 years later, and it is rife with pain and grief. We are ripped and shredded with the death that surrounds us. Death that it doesn't seem like the trumpets which have raged glorious in this story. It doesn't seem like death has been conquered. It does not feel like we have won. Here we are in a time when we feel more divided than ever, where we can have less conversations with each other, with people we disagree with than ever before. And when we see and hear about so much pain, what did it do? What did the resurrection accomplish? Christ is risen. How does it change anything? Here's the thing. The real the story of the gospel, it doesn't have the big twist, beautiful, gorgeous, stunning, sweeping ending either. That's not what the gospel we have today presents us with. I get it. I get the temptation to want to paste on a new ending. I wanted to paste on a new ending too, but that's not the story that we are giving. I never lost touch with my friend from college. He stayed in Southern California and I'm here and he pursued his dreams in filmmaking. And it was really great because you know, there's the magic of the internet. We get to keep in touch from afar and I could watch as he pursued his dreams and I could watch as he continued to come alive. Oh my gosh, and just recently he was at the Oscars because he's part of a production company that was literally winning an Oscar. I mean, dream come true kind of stuff. And along the way in there also, he fell in love and he got engaged. And then I got the invitation to the wedding and I looked at the date and it just happened to be a weekend. I was going to be in California already. Oh my goodness, how magical, how wonderful. And I was out there getting ready to go to this wedding. So excited for him. It was on a, it was on an old um, village film set, like an outdoor town film set, of course, that was converted to also be a wedding venue. It was gonna be so beautiful. And I was, uh, I was driving to the wedding. I remembered his parents and I wondered like, well, I hadn't heard that, I mean, they're gonna be at the wedding, but I hadn't heard anything about how his parents felt and where they were in all of this. And I figured, well, it, it must be okay. And I got to the wedding and of course it was so beautiful, such a gorgeous, happy ceremony. And then there was the reception <laughs> where during the first dances, he danced with his mother and his husband danced with his mother and the joy in their faces. And then all four of them got together, they all danced together and they each danced with their fathers and then all four of them with their fathers and then all, all of the parents and the two young men dancing together is such joy. And then there was the speeches. I, my parents were happy at my wedding, but I have never seen parents more happy, more joyful, more exuberant for the life ahead of their children than those parents. It was the most beautiful show of love that I have seen from parents. Maybe, I mean, it was just so glorious to see their love, to hear the inside jokes, to watch that, how this family had come together. And it does, in some ways, it feels like I'm pasting on the Easter ending, doesn't it? But that's not what happened because it was a wedding. It wasn't the end of a story. It was the beginning of their story. And it told a story about how love, the love that we find in the face of fear and all else, love sets us free. If we were to pick two words to sum up the whole of the gospel, to sum up all of Jesus's messages, we could pick love and liberation because that's what it all comes to time and time and time again. Jesus didn't spend any time talking about purity. He talked a lot though about how shouldn't be hoarding wealth. He talked a lot 
about how love should drive us to include the outsider, that the Samaritan, he told stories about the Samaritan, which really, that's the person who we least want to stop on the side of the road to pick us up out of the dirt. He talked about the person who is our enemy, the pure person we can't stand being the one to reach down and lift us up. And he didn't just talk about it, he did it too. He included the outsider. He included the tax, he brought the tax collector in and the women and the children and the unclean and everyone who society says does not fit. Jesus said, come in, you are a part of my closest, most cherished community. And love, love ultimately was the, is for the redemption of all people. That love driving us to liberation isn't just for the people that you or I think deserve it. It is for all of God's people. And Jesus preached that message so strongly with everything that he did and everything that he said. And he, and, and then we have this story of resurrection. We have this story that not even death can overwhelm this power of love driving us to redemption. That that is the story of it all. But here's the thing is that actually that's not just the story of Jesus. That is the story of all of scripture that all of God's story is that love is for all people and that love sets us free. I mean, we hear it in the midwives who saved Moses from the wrath. We hear it from, we hear it in the story of Moses leading the people from Egypt. We hear it in the way even after the great flood, there was the dove coming with the twig and the rainbow of hope for all people. That's the story of scripture, liberation, all of it. Here we are in that moment, looking at it and asking, what does resurrection do anyway? What does it change? It doesn't change anything. Wait, hear it. It doesn't change anything. God has always been with us, with love, driving us to liberation, and God is still with us in this moment in the moments when we feel the deepest dark of doubt and despair and loss and grief and turmoil and division, God is with us working for our liberation in all things at all times. What difference does the resurrection make? God is with us. God has always been with, with us. God will be with us. And the brilliance in Mark is that the ending of the story is not the ending. This story doesn't end, this story is the beginning. This story is our beginning. So if you look out at this world and you feel afraid, be afraid. There are things to be frightened by. There are things to feel put down by. It is all right to be afraid. And if fear has made you feel frozen and unable to do this work of, of caring, we are charged with carrying God's love. We are charged with proclaiming liberation for all people. And if fear has frozen you, it does not mean that you have not done it right. It means that we are not done yet. We are not done yet. We stand now at our beginning. Hallelujah, Jesus is risen. Hallelujah, may we live that story, amen.